How the State Preserves Itself Once a state has been established, the problem of the ruling group, or caste, is how to maintain their rule. While force is their modus operandi, their basic and long-run problem is ideological. For in order to continue in office, any government, not simply a democratic government, must have the support of the majority of its subjects. This support, it must be noted, need not be active enthusiasm. It may well be passive resignation, as if to an inevitable law of nature. But support in the sense of acceptance of some sort, it must be, else the minority of state rulers would eventually be outweighed by the active resistance of the majority of the public. Since predation must be supported out of the surplus of production, it is necessarily true that the class constituting the state, the full-time bureaucracy and nobility, must be a rather small minority in the land, although it may of course purchase allies among important groups in the population. Therefore the chief task of the rulers is always to secure the active or resigned acceptance of the majority of the citizens. Of course one method of securing support is through the creation of vested economic interests. Therefore the king alone cannot rule. He must have a sizable group of followers who enjoy the prerequisites of rule. For example, the members of the state apparatus, such as the full-time bureaucracy or the established nobility. But this still secures only a minority of eager supporters, and even the essential purchasing of support by subsidies and other grants of privilege still does not obtain the consent of the majority. For this essential acceptance, the majority must be persuaded by ideology, that their government is good, wise, and at least inevitable, and certainly better than other conceivable alternatives. Promoting this ideology among the people is the vital social task of the intellectuals. For the masses of men do not create their own ideas, or indeed think through these ideas independently, they follow passively the ideas adopted and disseminated by the body of intellectuals. The intellectuals are therefore the opinion moulders in society. And since it is precisely a moulding of opinion that the state most desperately needs, the basis for an age-old alliance between the state and the intellectuals becomes clear. It is evident that the state needs the intellectuals. It is not so evident why intellectuals need the state. Put simply, we may state that the intellectual's livelihood in the free market is never too secure, for the intellectual must depend on the values and choices of the masses of his fellow men, and it is precisely characteristic of the masses that they are generally uninterested in intellectual matters. The state, on the other hand, is willing to offer the intellectuals a secure and permanent berth in the state apparatus, and thus a secure income and the panoply of prestige. For the intellectuals will be handsomely rewarded for the important function they perform for the state rulers, of which group they now become a part. The alliance between the state and the intellectuals was symbolised in the eager desire of professors at the University of Berlin in the 19th century to form the intellectual bodyguard of the House of Hohenzollern. In the present day, let us note the revealing comment of an eminent Marxist scholar concerning Professor Vicht Vogel's critical study of ancient oriental despotism. The civilization which Professor Vicht Vogel is so bitterly attacking was one which could make poets and scholars into officials. Of innumerable examples, we may cite the recent development of the science of strategy in the service of the government's main violence-wielding arm, the military. A venerable institution, furthermore, is the official or court historian, dedicated to purveying the rulers' views of their own and their predecessors' actions. Many and varied have been the arguments by which the state and its intellectuals have induced their subjects to support their rule. Basically, the strands of argument may be summed up as follows. A. The state rulers are great and wise men. They rule by divine right. They are the aristocracy of men. They are the scientific experts. Much greater and wiser than the good but rather simple subjects. And b. Rule by the extent government is inevitable, absolutely necessary, and far better than the indescribable evils that would ensue upon its downfall. The union of church and state was one of the oldest and most successful of these ideological devices. 
The ruler was either anointed by God, or, in the case of absolute rule of many oriental despotisms, was himself God. Hence, any resistance to his rule would be blasphemy. The state's priestcraft performed the basic intellectual function of obtaining popular support and even worship for the rulers. Another successful device was to install fear of any alternative systems of rule or non-rule. The present rulers, it was maintained, supply the citizens an essential service for which they should be most grateful. Protection against sporadic criminals and marauders. For the state, to preserve its own monopoly of predation, did indeed see to it that private and unsystematic crime was kept to a minimum. The state has always been jealous of its own preserve. Especially has the state been successful in recent centuries in instilling fear of other state rulers. Since the land area of the globe has been parcelled out among particular states, one of the basic doctrines of the state was to identify itself with the territory it governed. Since most men tend to love their homeland, the identification of that land and its people with the state was a means of making natural patriotism work to the state's advantage. If Ruritania was being attacked by Waldavia, the first task of the state and its intellectuals was to convince the people of Ruritania that the attack was really upon them, and not simply upon the ruling caste. In this way, a war between rulers was converted into a war between peoples and each people coming to the defence of its rulers in the erroneous belief that these rulers were defending them. This device of nationalism has only been successful in Western civilization in recent centuries. It was not too long ago that the mass of subjects regarded wars as irrelevant battles between various sets of nobles. Many and subtle are the ideological weapons that the state has wielded through the centuries. One excellent weapon has been tradition. The longer that the rule of a state has been able to preserve itself, the more powerful this weapon. For then the X dynasty, or the Y state, has the seeming weight of centuries of tradition behind it. Worship of one's ancestors then becomes a none too subtle means of worshipping one's ancient rulers. The greatest danger to the state is independent intellectual criticism. There is no better way to stifle that criticism than to attack any isolated voice, any raiser of new doubts, as a profane violator of the wisdom of his ancestors. Another potent ideological force is to deprecate the individual and exalt the collectivity of society. For since any given rule implies majority acceptance, any ideological danger to that rule can only start from one or a few independently thinking individuals. The new idea, much less the new critical idea, must necessarily begin as a small minority opinion. Therefore the state must nip the view in the bud by ridiculing any view that defies the opinions of the mass. Listen only to your brothers, or adjust to society, thus becoming ideological weapons for crushing individual dissent. By such measures the masses will never learn of the non-existence of their emperor's clothes. It is also important for the state to make its rule seem inevitable. Even if its reign is disliked, it will then be met with passive resignation, as witness the familiar coupling of death and taxes. One method is to induce historiographical determinism, as opposed to individual freedom of will. If the X dynasty rules us, this is because the inexorable laws of history, or the divine will, or the absolute, or the material productive forces, have so decreed, and nothing any puny individuals may do can change this inevitable decree. It is also important for the state to inculcate in its subjects an aversion to any conspiracy theory of history. For a search for conspiracies means a search for motives and an attribution of responsibility for historical misdeeds. If, however, any tyranny imposed by the state, or venality or aggressive war, was caused not by the state rulers but by mysterious and arcane social forces, or by the imperfect state of the world, or if in some way everyone was responsible, we are all murderers, proclaims one slogan, then there is no point to the people becoming indignant or rising up against such misdeeds. Furthermore, an attack on conspiracy theories 
means that the subjects will become more gullible in believing the general welfare reasons that are always put forth by the state for engaging in any of its despotic actions. A conspiracy theory can unsettle the system by causing the public to doubt the state's ideological propaganda. Another tried and true method for bending subjects to the state's will is inducing guilt. Any increase in private well-being can be attacked as unconscionable greed, materialism or excessive affluence. Profit-making can be attacked as exploitation and usury, mutually beneficial exchanges denounced as selfishness, and somehow with the conclusion always being drawn that more resources should be siphoned from the private to the public sector. The induced guilt makes the public more ready to do just that. For while individual persons tend to indulge in selfish greed, the failure of the state's rulers to engage in exchanges is supposed to signify their devotion to higher and nobler causes. Parasitic predation being apparently morally and aesthetically lofty as compared to peaceful and productive work. In the present more secular age, the divine right of the state has been supplemented by the invocation of a new god, science. State rule is now proclaimed as being ultra-scientific, as constituting planning by experts. But while reason is invoked more than in previous centuries, this is not the true reason of the individual and his exercise of free will. It is still collectivist and determinist, still implying holistic aggregates and coercive manipulation of passive subjects by their rulers. The increasing use of scientific jargon has permitted the state's intellectuals to weave obscurantist apologia for state rule that would have only met with derision by the populace of a simpler age. A robber who justified his theft by saying that he really helped his victims by his spending giving a boost to retail trade would find few converts. But when this theory is clothed in Keynesian equations and impressive references to the multiplier effect, it unfortunately carries more conviction. And so the assault on common sense proceeds, each age performing the task in its own ways. Thus, ideological support being vital to the state, it must unceasingly try to impress the public with its legitimacy, to distinguish its activities from those of mere brigands. The unremitting determination of its assaults on common sense is no accident, for, as Mencken vividly maintained, the average man, whatever his errors otherwise, at least sees clearly that government is something lying outside him and outside the generality of his fellow man, that it is a separate, independent and hostile power, only partly under his control and capable of doing him great harm. Is it a fact of no significance that robbing the government is everywhere regarded as a crime of less magnitude than robbing an individual or even a corporation? What lies behind all this, I believe, is a deep sense of the fundamental antagonism between the government and the people it governs. It is apprehended not as a committee of citizens chosen to carry on the communal business of the whole population, but as a separate and autonomous corporation, mainly devoted to exploiting the population for the benefit of its own members. When a private citizen is robbed, a worthy man is deprived of the fruits of his industry and thrift. When the government is robbed, the worst that happens is that certain rogues and loafers have less money to play with than they had before. The notion that they have earned that money is never entertained. To most sensible men it would seem ludicrous. <laughs>